In this video, we'll learn about capacitive effects in the PN junction. The depletion region that forms in PN junctions is an insulator between two conducting parts of the junction, the P side and the N side. So it's not surprising that we have capacitance here between these two conductors separated by an insulator. Now with the reverse bias voltage applied, VR, the voltage on this capacitor increases, which implies that extra charge has to be stored in each side of this depletion region, since that's the only place where net charge arises in the PN junction. Now, since the density of charge on each side of the junction is determined by the dopant concentrations, and so is not changed when the reverse voltage applies, is applied, the only way that we can get an increase in net positive and negative charge on each side of the junction is if the depletion region grows and extends further away from the PN interface here as the reverse bias voltage increases. So in effect, you can think of this as a kind of parallel plate capacitor separated by intrinsic silicon as the insulator except that the separation between the plates of the capacitor is a function of the voltage across it. So this is unlike the conventional linear capacitors that we're used to. In fact, this is a nonlinear capacitor. And instead of the charge stored on the capacitor Q being a linear function of the voltage across it, instead it's related by this nonlinear function, a square root shown here. The other constants in this charge equation here include the cross-sectional area of the PN junction. Not surprisingly, junctions with larger cross-sectional area will store more charge. The dielectric constant of silicon, fundamental electronic charge, and the dopant concentrations on each side of the PN junction. All these constants are wrapped up together in the single constant alpha here. So in this formulation, we've emphasized the square root relationship between reverse bias voltage and charge stored up on the junction, Q, J. For a normal linear capacitor, the charge stored on it is linearly proportional to the voltage across it, in which case we would expect a plot of charge stored on the capacitor to voltage across it to be a straight line going through the origin. But instead, if we plot the expression for the charge stored on a reverse bias PN junction, versus the reverse voltage on at VR, we end up with a plot like this, whose shape is determined by the square root function shown here. Now, the capacitance of a normal linear capacitor is determined by the slope of the charge voltage relationship. Similarly, we can define the effective capacitance of the reverse bias PN junction as being the slope of this curve. The problem is that the slope changes depending on the precise bias voltage applied. So what we can say is that the capacitance at a given reverse bias voltage, VR, let's say one equal to this particular quiescent bias point, VQ, is given by the local slope of this curve here. That is the derivative evaluated at the point Q. An expression for that derivative can be found by differentiating our expression for QJ with respect to VR. And what we find is that the effective capacitance of the PN junction is inversely related to the square root of the voltage across it. So that for higher reverse bias voltages, the capacitance appears to be less. The relationship is repeated here in the top right. Normally, instead of being expressed as a function of alpha, however, we express the junction capacitance in terms of its value at zero reverse bias. That's represented by the symbol CJ0 here. CJ0 is obviously related to alpha as well as the built-in voltage of the PN junction. So this expression here is more commonly used 
to find the junction capacitance as a function of the reverse voltage across it. When a forward bias voltage is applied across the PN junction, the depletion region shrinks and there's a, a tendon decrease in the charge stored in the depletion region. So that capacitive effect is still there and the effective capacitance due to it appears to decrease. However, there's an additional charge storage mechanism that shows up and becomes significant under forward bias conditions. As we've seen before, under forward bias, we see an excess of minority carriers showing up on both the N side and P side of the junction. These excess minority carriers are an additional reservoir of charge that has to be supplied and taken away as a forward bias voltage is applied and removed. So therefore it contributes to the total capacitance of the PN junction in forward bias. How far this reservoir of minority carrier charge extends away from the PN junction and thus ultimately the total amount of charge being stored in these reservoirs depends on how quickly the minority charge carriers recombine with the majority carriers on each side of the junction as they diffuse away from the PN interface. Thus, the so-called diffusion capacitance is a strong function of the minority carrier lifetime, which is the mean time taken for minority carriers to recombine. For holes, we use the subscript P. For electrons, the subscript N. The subscript T captures both the P and N minority charge carriers. The total capacitance of the PN junction and forward bias includes both the diffusion capacitance and the depletion region capacitance. However, typically the diffusion capacitance dominates and uh, is the larger of the two terms.